All right, it being uh, a little after 7.30, I call this session to order. And the first item on our agenda is uh, in order of taking, order of taking a Middlesex Turnpike. Ms. Stanton. Yes, so the conservation restriction has been signed and authorized by the state and forwarded to our attention. This is the last step along with the awarding of damages to complete Rick's long enjoyed and suffering Middlesex Turnpike. So we're just going to do some presentation. We have a document for you guys to sign. We also have an updated map so that you can see what we submitted to the state. And there are uh, documents for you to sign that Jenny will be circulating. Mr. Reed, <laughs> the floor is yours. Um, so um, as, as you know, I was here uh, five weeks ago, I guess, um, on December 3rd. Uh, and at that point, you uh, heard a presentation about the conservation restriction that the town had uh, been negotiating for at 174 or 176 Middlesex Turnpike. And um, the selectmen did vote to approve that conservation uh, restriction and also since then the state has uh, signed off Secretary Beaton, uh, <coughs> Executive Office of Environment Affairs um, has um, approved that. Um, so now uh, because we had been unable to uh, really get the one part of the ownership on board with this, what's left to do is for the selectmen to approve an order of taking uh, for the conservation restriction. There are really two parties of interest uh, where this conservation restriction lies. Um, a conservation restriction is very much like an easement. It doesn't change the underlying ownership of the property. And on this particular area uh, that's shown on the exhibit that um, I have in front of me and um, maybe you have a smaller version of it, uh, it's just a portion of, of 174, 176 Middlesex Turnpike. There are really two parcels, one being 174, one the other 176. Um, they happen to be the, uh, each a parcel where a large office building, which is where RSA security is located, um, part of the Dell EMC Corporation, but that's all deep, deep back off the roadway. This conservation restriction is out front right on the Middlesex Turnpike area, um, and between the two parcels, it, the conservation restriction encompasses 6 point, almost 0.2 acres. Um, when the property owner, uh, preceding the property owner, the Terrace Corporation uh, owned this uh, a while back, um, they themselves, uh, before they sold it, put a land lease on this uh, area where the conservation restriction is that essentially left them the ability to develop the property for the next 99 years. That was about, um, I don't know if you remember the specifics, but maybe 13 or 17 years ago, or probably more like 13. So there's 80, um, seven or 86 years left on that land lease. And because of that, the real value of giving up the right to develop this property through a conservation restriction, that's with the land lease uh, owner of the property, not the underlying title owner to the property. So in preparation for this, an appraisal was done. Um, the value of the overall conservation restriction was um, listed at seven hundred and twenty five excuse me, seven hundred and twenty thousand dollars by the appraiser that we engaged to do this. Um, the appraiser is someone who's authorized to work on mass DOT projects and is experienced in highway um, related um, property acquisitions. Um, the the portion attributable to the Terrace Corporation is seven hundred and twenty less three thousand five hundred dollars. Uh, so whatever math is on that, uh, seven hundred sixteen five, I guess. And then um, the remaining three thousand five hundred dollars is the estimated uh, or appraised uh, underlying value that rests with the underlying property owner. So what? In discussions with our town council's office, Bob Nangirati has been working from town council's office to uh, help with this. Uh, we agreed that it would be best for the selectmen to um, 
award the damages as the appraiser has um, um, appraised them, uh, and hopefully the property owner will accept those after people are taking this report. Um, they have a right to challenge that at some point in time if they, if they want to, but I think three years after you are taking this reported. But once you vote the order of taking, as soon as you do so tonight, this will be recorded at the registry and the town will have satisfied the environmental permitting requirements for the new section of the getting the project bid. So um, there's also a development restriction that the Guterres Corporation held on the property and in exchange for releasing the uh, $716,500 uh, value that they would have in this property, they would like to be released of an obligation that they agreed to to build the inner, to, to, to renovate the intersection of Lexington Street and Middlesex Turnpike in the record the intersection improvement project and traffic light. That was actually put in there in the development restriction many years ago because um, it was thought that maybe the, the main portion of the Guterres site would develop preceding the construction of the middle sex turnpike project, but that is not what has happened. So the middle sex turnpike project itself is taking care of the intersection improvements that otherwise would have been done by the Guterres Corporation. So it's, it's relieving fair. them of that is not relieving them of anything. Correct. Correct. So it's fair, it's fair for them in view of the fact that they're willing to give up the development rights. It seems fair for the time to uh, relieve them of that restriction, mm -hmm. uh, the provision of restriction. So I think we all recommend that you go to approve both the um, release of the Guterres Corporation and the amendment to their um, development description, which is the third amendment to the creation of development descriptions, and, and then also approve the order of taking the people in the order of $3,500 to Cole, Massachusetts. Um, and that organization, Cole, Massachusetts, still exists as an entity, but they're really wholly owned by uh, REIT Incorporated, which is a real estate investment trust um, company out of Phoenix. Uh, Any questions, concerns? Just a quick one on the um, Declaration of Development Restrictions. There's just a, the, de the declaration um, where a paragraph is deleted and replaced in its entirety, um, having to do with the development oh, page of, two. on page two, development of non-retail uses on the land and has a not to exceed amount. Is, is that something that, uh, is that part of the negotiations that we just did or is that something that kind of, uh, is this new, new information, that particular? No. no. Okay. This is actually, it's a little, I, I was looking at this a few minutes ago and realized and it might have been useful for you to see the current version yeah. of the development restrictions. However, um, this essentially leaves language that's already in place. I believe there's additional language that adds the requirement of building the Lexington uh, Street intersection. So something has been removed from that exactly. paragraph. Okay, that's what I sort of, I just wanted to make sure that I understood that correctly. So if we, if we just approve this third amendment, we will be accomplishing both the things that you talked about? You need two motions. Uh, you need two motions. motions. You can do it all in one motion, but you need to approve the uh, amendment to the declaration, the third amendment to the declaration. Of the and, and does that, in effect, remove the requirement of dealing yes. with Lexington? Yes. That's, yes. What I, that's what I meant by my yes. question. Yes. And then you also need to approve the order of the any other questions? I will accept a motion if somebody would be so bold. Feel free to jump in. Look at the slide. I'm approve the order of eminent domain taking uh, 174 and 176 Middlesex Turnpike in the amount of 3,500. Second. So we have a motion to do so in a second. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is carried 5-0-0. Then we need another motion. 
having to do with the Third Amendment? Um, I move that the selectmen accept the Third Amendment to the Declaration of Development Restrictions for the address again, 174, 176, Middlesex Turnpike, Middlesex Turnpike, thank you, um, as outlined in the memo of December 13th, 2018. Second. Motion and a second. No other discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Motion's carried 5 zero, zero. And we thank you for all you do in this regard, and we're glad you're still doing it. Yeah. It's not official until we've signed it. I actually uh, <clears throat> drove up Middlesex Turnpike today, and it's, they're, out, they're still working today. And I, I'm pretty impressed with the progress that's being made. It seems good weather. I'm talking to some people to find out what they think. But um, you know, uh, in other projects that they can seem to have taken long, this is the most complex portion of the project. And so um, originally, it was planned to be four years long. So it seems to me they're making. As long as I can move those telephone poles. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be the last thing. What will thing. we do when that joke kept the work anymore? Oh, I don't think we have that problem. All right, the next item is uh, conservation you. restriction on Cheever's Path. Sure, so you have a memo included in your packets from Catherine Perry from the planning department. She's here with Bob Sperano to talk about um, selectmen requesting to accept two trail easements on behalf of the town. Um, look at a little bit of background on Cheever's Path. This is rel relatively straightforward. The matter is certainly not new to the town. All sorts of background, including photographs of the action. I'm just going to do a quick overview of the action needed. Good evening. Good evening. I'd like to introduce it. I'm Catherine Terry, assistant planner. Um, something what it says on the agenda, this isn't a conservation restriction, it's an acceptance of trail easements. Um, I think that got mixed up with the item we thought it was a conservation restriction. Um, yeah, the Shooters Path development was approved by the planning board in 2015. It was completed in 2017 and 2018. In um, conjunction with the application, the um, developer has thrown on here, um, proposed to create a public trail easement from South Road through to the Midland Lakeway, which is uh, the public benefit. Um, to achieve that with two parts of it, most of the trail is within the development property, um, and the easement was in fact put in place one, but it now needs to be and then we just deal with um, fine tuning on the site to preserve the features on it. So um, Mr. Sperano can explain that a bit more. But the second part was actually owned by W.E. Andrews, and so to complete the trail, you need to negotiate for an easement from that property owner, which is now succeeded in doing. So what we're asking you to do is to accept the revised version of the first travel easement and the um, second easement. So you simply need to go to accept the two trail easements on behalf of the town and the second easement. I don't know if I want to say a bit more detail. Or, you know, other than to introduce myself, um, Robert Scarano, I'm the developer of the cottages at Depot Crossing. Um, the uh, nine units have been completed over there. Uh, we have uh, obtained uh, all the documents necessary in order to effectuate the easements that were uh, considered as part of the approval process. Uh, they have now all come together. Um, and this is a confirmatory easement, as uh, Catherine indicated. The first easement was put on record at the Registry of Deeds. Um, Subsequently, we negotiated the second easement with W.E. Andrews, who uh, provided that with no consideration, uh, and uh, uh, we thank them for the town uh, for making that connection to the to the uh, rail tra uh, trailway. Um, and at this point, the new plan is before you. I have the original mylar that will be recorded at the Registry of Deeds. So what you have is a copy of the mylar. Um, the original documents that you would be signing this evening would also be recorded uh, with the confirmatory easement. Uh, in effect, the town is accepting uh, the easement that I created over the uh, project itself and the easement granted by W.E. Andrews, which connects it all to the rail, uh, to the uh, bike trail. 
I have to admit that I haven't been out there specifically to look at it. I certainly drive by your development all the time. The, the path itself goes through the southerly side of your property, I believe. Correct. And where does it connect with the rail trail? It actually crosses the front of the entire project because we granted the town and its residents the ability to cut from the um, sidewalk through the property if they so desired. Uh, it does continue all the way down the, so the southern side uh, and it cuts through the woods to the back of the original development property. There was about 80 feet of property um, that was owned by W.E. Andrews uh, between that and train. the bike trail. So just behind W.E. Andrews is, is where it joins the rail Correct. trail. Correct. There's, there's, the, tiny path. there's the small brook, there's the uh, bike trail, and then there's a dry connection of 80 feet um, from the back of the cottages project to the bike trail. And that's the W.E. Andrews portion uh, of the easement. And by the way, it's only seven and a half feet wide. It's not designed to be for motorized vehicles. It's only designed for bicycles and uh, pedestrian traffic. Uh, and it is approved under um, the state's recreational statute. So there's no liability associated uh, with people traveling over either easement um, and uh, the, the performance of maintenance is in the condominium documents so the condominium association takes care of all maintenance associated with the easements themselves the paths uh, which consist of stone dust I'm just going to ask you stone dust and natural uh, over the W.E. Andrews portion that's not improved at all uh, that's basically a pine bed uh, of needles and, and, and fallings is, is the town free to put stone dust on that part of the trail if it wants to? I, I would think Elizabeth Bagdonis would have something to say about that, but um, um, I think the documents are very clear that that portion of the trail remains natural, um, mm -hmm. and that was what was reflected in the documents. Um, I think it's better that way uh, as well, uh, because you have so much natural um, vegetation falling, uh, but the pedestrian traffic itself keeps the path at a minimum of seven and a half feet um, and that's easily easily traversed um, we think that uh, the uh, stone path through the original development is more than sufficient to get people uh, to that small crossing anybody saying anything about signage there is provisions in there for signage uh, but we were leaving that up to the trail committee um, so that they could do, they could uh, determine what was necessary for signage uh, but the documents cover signage um, and it's permitted mm -hmm. so is the trail committee planning to look into a sign from the rail trail end which is possibly where it's most needed yeah. And that was my question as well. We have a kind of uniform little trailhead marker on a, a piece of pressurized lumber with our logo on it. I think that you, when you see that, people, consistent. it's consistent along the way because there are the places where along the bike path, you'll look, you'll see an opening, you'll be, you know, because sometimes it's really not clear, but if, if you see that little um, post with the seal on it, then you know that it's legitimate and you're legally okay. So. We, did use, we did use granite posts for our demarcation for wetland mm -hmm. and protected interest under the act uh, at, at, the, at Elizabeth's uh, be, bequest. Those are in, they also have the identifying mark of, okay. of the town on them. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that would be uh, consistent right. with, uh, with the markings that are in place in the field. Mm -hmm. Great. There's a little unique sign pointing to the town forest. And you know the one I mean heading toward Lexington on the bike path. And there's a cut through mm -hmm. the town forest. And it looks like kind of a homemade sign. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Oh, I appreciate the opportunity to create more connectivity for our walkers and bikers. We, we think it was uh, it was um, well planned uh, by your former director um, and uh, well executed by the current staff uh, who stayed on top of things. Uh, and uh, we thank uh, W. E. Andrews for making it possible. Well, I, I guess we thank you for going to W. E. Andrews right? <laughs> yes. and making it work with them. So thank you for for, for doing that. A couple of tries, but I think once they realized what the benefits were, and it really, there's no liability associated with it. I think once they realized that small piece, small piece, it, it, it yeah. came together. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we need a uh, motion to uh, accept this 
yeah. restriction? It's actually easement. two easements. Two easements. Uh, just to clarify, it would be with two yeah. easements you're accepting, two. one from the developer of cottages and one from W.E. Andrews yeah. that combined allow access over the entire trail system. Does it matter? Should we make it two separate motions? Does it matter? It could. It could be one. I think one's fine. Okay. The, the two. Sure. I'll move that uh, the selectmen accept a grant of trail easement uh, from R.R. Donnelly and Sons Company, as well as a grant of trail easement from Maskey Development Corporation for the um, bicycle and pedestrian connection on uh, Long Cheever's Path. The development's called Cheaper's Path. It, yeah, the, 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 the Cheaper's Path development. And I would add there's another grant tour that would be the condominium trust at, at Cottages at Depot Crossing. I'm the trustee as well as the developer, so I sign in two capacities just for clarification. Okay, so we accept the trail easement both from the Maskey Development Corporation as well as the trust for uh, the, co the cottages at Depot. The cottages at Depot Crossing Condominium Trust. Thank you. Thank you. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion is carried 5 0 mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you for Thank all you. you did. All right. So this is just the chair. Terrific. Just the chair. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Do we have facilities? Come on down, I guess. We're talking about library HVAC contract. So before you tonight is a proposed contract for $64,450. This is in response to the RFP for HVAC schematic and design services related to the public library. I think there were four proposals submitted in total. Sierra and his team did as long as the library, agreed to look background checking, to look, Northeast Engineering looks as though they have the most proposal um, so we're recommending approval of that proposed contract. As you can tell you can see in the letter that you submitted there are a series of deadlines to be met all of which would be included in the contract language as well for deliverables. We will talk about police next. Please don't look at the screen it's upcoming things. <laughs> Or is yours, Mr. Lani? It's like your eyes are just drawn. <laughs> yeah, so we advertised, we had four people respond, four companies, and like, we did the usual uh, evaluation, and we selected Northeast. We have worked with all, uh, all of their staff on various sort of projects that they work uh, at uh, different buildings for us. Uh, they understand. Thank you. They really understand our needs and our uh, building. Uh, this is a building, the library, as you know, uh, has two sections. One was the original 1966 HVAC with boilers only and cooling system only. So you can imagine in the shoulder season, like May, when it gets really warm, and they turn off the heat, they turn on the AC, you're done for the season. So if it gets cold again in May, for half the building, this is it. You're trying to steal really heat from the other half. The other half was renovated in 1999. They added a 20,000 square foot addition and they installed the right equipment. Uh, so the, the study is really to come up with something that, uh, that would be efficient. Uh, we used to have five, six boilers here at the town hall. We were down to one with the MEP project, so we expect the same. Uh, they have five boilers at the library, and we expect to go down to one condensing boiler. So there's a lot of benefits. Uh, like Sarah said, there are timelines. There are five tasks they have to achieve, and uh, and you know we will consider really every renewable option, every sustainability option, everything to not just reduce the the energy, but to get something that's maintainable for us. Uh, it's uh, very difficult right now with the chiller on the roof, different systems, two systems fighting each other. Uh, so. Any question? Well, that, that was my only question, was just going to be... I'm sorry. Um, all right, no, that's fine. I appreciate that you anticipated that I was going to ask about energy efficiency. And I know, you know, from your uh, dedication to improving the energy efficiency of all of our buildings that we're in good hands, um, I guess just wondered um, if there will be some sort of 
the counting after after the project is done of, of how much energy savings we might expect and if the building will be commissioned. Yes, absolutely. So this is just uh, a study and the schematic design so they can come up with the estimate for the project mm -hmm. before we come back and uh, do the really construction. But uh, we keep track of it now. It's very easy to really, a few years from now when the project is completed, mm -hmm. it's very easy to compare. And so they, they are, Northeast Engineering is aware of our deep and abiding interest in energy efficiency. Yes, in fact. <laughs> uh, I can, one of their really members, uh, one of their staff members is actually, he helped us oversee the project here at Town Hall, so he's very well aware. Uh, he does a lot of universities and colleges, and so he's well aware of really uh, what needs to be done. Great. Move that the selectmen approve a contract, the amount of $64,450 with Northeast Engineering for the Bedford Street Public Library HVAC study and schematic design. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Motion's carried 5 zero, zero. Thank you. And then I assume you're going to stick around to talk about the Police Department, Ms. Stanton. The next item before you is looking at the next steps related to the police uh, feasibility study, building upgrades and renovations. Uh, as you know, this was presented to you almost five years ago relating to looking at the potential expansion and renovation of the Bedford Police Department based on needs. To keep in line with the capital plan and the funding schedule that we have in place for the next six years, uh, here and the chief and our consultant have been working closely to try to identify the next steps for design, what the potential options could be for said design, options we should be looking at, so that we can keep on a uh, relatively consistent construction schedule as we plan for as part of the six-year plan. So tonight's presentation is to do an overview, sort of get a better handle on what those next steps look like. Um, and if we have, if there are greater discussions above and beyond this, obviously we can do follow-up. We want to do a preliminary update from the information presented five years ago. Thank you, Sarah. So, uh, like Sarah said, that was a good uh, int intro to the project. I would like to introduce Jeff Shaw. Uh, Jeff was uh, uh, was the main, the principal architect on the study that we presented a few years ago. Uh, after Jeff does his own, I would like to really come back and just give you a timeline for what uh, we're thinking and look for feedback from us. So, Jeff. Uh, my name is Jeff Shaw, I'm principal at Context Architecture. Our firm used to be called Donovan Sweeney Architecture and we actually designed the original expansion of the building for the police station purpose um, back 20 plus years ago. So um, it's exciting to be asked to come back and help the chief um, look at how the needs have evolved and what could be done to um, best address those needs. So our study here uh, looked at the existing facilities and um, let me just, yeah. all right, there we go. Um, so the purpose was of the study uh, was to, um, or I'm going to actually talk about the purpose in a second, go through the space needs program, design options, cost estimate, and the final report. Um, so the purpose uh, was to look at the needs of the police department um, for the immediate near-term future uh, current needs as well as future growth for the, the uh, police department within the town. And um, we covered that over the next 20 years, um, anticipating that it's probably going to be longer, but that's what we could foresee uh, with the chief's help. We limited our work to just the existing site, so we didn't look at any new sites, other locations for the police department, and we also had to take into consideration for with the historical society offices, which at the time we did it, our study were um, using, utilizing a portion, a good portion of the original building. Uh, I'm going to go through a series of slides, and you may have seen these before, or at least toward the police station, but these are the conditions that the uh, police department is working with. Um, the original lockers, um, they've now outgrown the number of lockers that they had originally, and they're using every single available space. Um, obviously, a little housekeeping might be in order, but that's to also say that the original lockers aren't as wide as what we now install in modern 
I should say, uh, um, contemporary police stations. In fact, we also usually integrate the benching into the lockers, um, so there's no benches in the middle of the, the walkway space. They have particular components, um, um, compartments for weapons and other um, gear that they, they carry with them as well as boot trays and things like that. So there's a lot that could be done to improve the conditions there. Uh, shower space as well, um, as well as the female side of, of the equation, that they need quite a bit more space than what they have currently. Uh, training room, it looks like a nice space, but it's not big enough to accomplish the training that the police department would need to have. Um, and uh, want to improve some of the technology in there. It also does double duty. We're used to do double duty with the historical commission. Uh, evidence, again, um, some organization would be nice, but this does underscore the fact that they have run out of space for evidence, evidence collection, evidence processing. This is the room that should be used for bagging, tagging, and processing fingerprints, things like that, and should be providing much better access to the equipment and uh, the ability to actually to use the room efficiently. Detectives space, uh, this room is shared basically by the entire detectives department. Um, and there's no private office space. Uh, there's no space for um, major casework to be undertaken, no space for laying out evidence in a, in a particular crime that may have happened um, that, you know, and they want to actually study it as a team. So this needs improvement. Fitness room is in the basement. It is a pretty cramped room, always was, um, and now the um, current best practices are to have a real functioning fitness center for the officers, so this is something that needs to be uh, modernized, expanded. In the patrol area, again, um, very cramped quarters, uh, not great space for roll call and the way that they would like to do roll call. They're using the sally port as a garage. Uh, this is where prisoners are uh, taken in and so that all of that stuff shouldn't be in the room, but there's no other place to put it right now. Armory, uh, again, they've, they've grown out of space here. So, in summary, their existing space, 47, or 14,700. Can I ask a question about that quickly? Certainly can. Is that, is that the space available only to the police, or is right. that, so that doesn't include the historic society? Correct. That's what they're currently using, utilizing for police. Um, to meet the current space demands, the demands of today, we'd need a 2,600 roughly square foot increase, and then to meet what the study determined as future demand would be about 4,000 square foot increase. And the way our study looked at space, we did a what we call like an, an idealized space study. That means outside of the confines of this particular building, what would the ideal shapes and sizes of the rooms need to be to meet the demand? So, you know, a particular rectangular space of a certain size could house um, an office with standard office equipment. And we went through every single space for the entire department. We also, in addition to that, look at um, other things like stairs, walls, mechanical um, shaft space, things like that. And we call that a grossing factor that we apply to the net square footage, the square footage in each room. And so these numbers include that grossing factor. So that would be thinking of it in a more idealized way. And when we get into the next stage, the design stage, we are looking at how do we fit this, the, that program need into the container that we have, the existing building, and what doesn't make it, what do we have to make additions for to hold. And so what frequently happens is we may be able to be more efficient than our original study um, space needs anticipated. We usually use about a 35% grossing factor and for uh, this idealized space needs, but when we're actually designing it, we're looking at actual needs or actual ability of satisfying the space need within the building. So you'll note that the square footages don't necessarily match and that's because of that efficiency in the design and uh, what spaces are actually um, needed to be to mean, main, maintain the space needs. So we looked at four options. Uh, main difference between A and A1 is the histor historical society moving out, but both of them are intended to meet the current needs. Same thing with option B. Um, and then in option C, uh, this was the, the goal of this was to meet the future need. Um, 
basically the study was looking at this from both a space needs but also a budgeting standpoint trying to capture certain sort of target segments for cost as well. Um, so there was real the delineations between how much would each version cost. So in option A, uh, total is about 16,350 square feet. There is uh, an addition, one addition to the building. It's the area coded in dark blue. Uh, everything else is existing space. And the uh, historical society remains in place in this option. So mainly we're moving some walls around, moving some space around. And the biggest gain here is a change to the locker room space. The men's locker room gets a lot more space from the, uh, the addition in the basement. And on the upper floor of that addition, the training room moves in to this space and gets uh, much larger. Uh, and this would be sort of in that alcove between the existing building and the new building. Um, we would improve some of the roll call space. Uh, we'd add an office to the records room, existing records room, and um, change uh, how we'd basically take over the gym for an evidence room and, um, and do some renovations for uh, records keeping. In option B, many of these things remain, uh, with the exception that we're now going to take over a portion of the, or all of the historical society space. This assumes they're moved out. Police chief moves into their offices. There's a small conference room, an admin assistant. Basically, an administrative um, suite gets made out of the historical society space. Um, same types of other changes that I listed previously. And then uh, in this option, we would also move the emergency generator to the outside. We put it in an uh, acoustic enclosure to try to mitigate noise as much as possible. But it is currently located in the basement of the building. Uh, and we're going to reutilize that space for a fitness room and move the generator outside. Uh, this is to get the best sort of bang for our buck. And then in option B, um, we have repositioned the training room, basically where it is now, but we've expanded it to include all of the historical society. Um, we've moved the police chief and his office suite to a slightly different area. We are now making an additional expansion towards the parking lot, the police parking lot on the opposite side of the building uh, for evidence and a new gym and some of the other changes to locker rooms, uh, the records area, and detective spaces. Um, this particular option, uh, even though it is slightly better than the option A's, was less desirable because of the configuration of the meeting room. It just wasn't very effective. You got more space, but it wasn't able to be used very well because it's an odd-shaped room. And then finally, in option C, which uh, we think does meet the, uh, the needs of the department, at around 17,750 square feet. Again, two additions, one um, out the side of the building that I mentioned before for training room as well as locker room, and the other towards the um, parking lot, uh, which has evidence on the lower level and a new roll call area on the upper level, but then reconfigures the, the way the patrol is handled within the building and makes it a lot better use of that space for the department. Um, we then get a, a bigger fitness room, which really meets the goal that we had at the beginning, uh, keeping the emergency generator up outside. And in many of these options, I, I neglected to say that the because the chief is now moving downstairs, all the administrative offices mainly move downstairs, it means the second floor of the police station becomes entirely devoted to de detectives. So it actually makes their um, um, work life better, um, and it gives them the space to do the work that they, they need to do. So this is where the sort of current recommendation is. Um, then we went through and looked at, you know, real briefly what would be needed on site. Um, we'd lose at least one parking space to the emergency generator and enclosure. Uh, we'd have to do some trenching to, to tie that back into the electrical system inside the building. Uh, this, this diagram does not show the additions, by the way, on it. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have talked about the, whether or not there's the possibility of uh, a, dri a secondary driveway being um, made out towards the front. Can I just stop yeah. you because you, there is it points out landscaping improvements right. on the historic front of the Stearns building. Yes. And so my questions are sort of twofold. One is, what are the landscape improvements mm -hmm. that you envision? And then I guess I just want to um, I just want to point out just 
not that it necessarily affects the space needs, but just the perception of what is the front and the back of the building. Absolutely. And I think with this um, this very tragic situation that occurred recently in Somerville with Somerville Hospital mm -hmm. and the marking of a of an of what appeared to be an entrance not being an entrance. Um, this is a public safety building open 24/7, and this is going to look like the front of the building. I mean, it does look like the front of the building. Sure. So I just want to kind of put that out there that as we move forward with this that we make sure that there's adequate signage and indications because that, as I'm understanding the schematics, that door is a false door and it's just the back of somebody's office, essentially. That's correct. A lot of our early discussions about this project when we talked about the possibility of the Historical Society moving out centered around that very question, which is what do you do with the original front face of the building when that in, cannot, can no longer be an entrance, um, which is why in sort of diagrammatic form I said there's got to be some sort of landscaping improvements because we have to reinforce to people that it's no longer a functioning entrance. But we also have to, on the other hand, balance the historical aspects of the building. We can't just board it up and, you know, it's no longer an entrance and brick it over and, and, and the building's going to look different. We want to respect that historical fabric. So it has to be, whatever design solution that's prepared has to be very sensitive to both conditions. Um, irrespective of that, there will be security cameras. So if anybody did happen to wander up there, that would be completely apparent to the 911 operators who have those cameras in the communications room. So that, I don't believe that scenario would happen, but um, we do, that is a major component of whatever design is ultimately proposed as to what, what do you do to that mm -hmm. front face of that building and what sort of landscaping reinforces that that's no longer an entrance. Okay, thank you. Uh, with regard to that sort of thing, when this addition was put on the Stearns building originally, the uh, Historic District Commission, this is in the historic district was deeply involved in the process and I would hope even though the town has the right to do pretty much what it wants to do with its own buildings that that input from that organization would be respected and I, I so as you were talking about the expansion of the current training room slash museum of the Historic uh, Society. I assume that's in that little indentation. That's right. Yeah, there would be uh, an addition. The next rendering will show it in oh, okay. three dimensions. But there, in in Here plan there. view, it would be in that indentation on the Here right. Is, you got an arrow right there in front. Yep. Yeah, so it would be, the new addition would fill in this right. little area right here. And would it stand out into the lawn a little and bit. Depending on which one of these scenarios chose, it would stick out that's further right. than the existing That's right, it would plane. stick out further in this. This is the, the rendering from uh, the, that side view. So you can oh. see here, this would be the new addition. Now, of course, this is a very early conceptual oh, rendering, and, rendering and, and many things are subject to change. But um, some of the architectural um, questions would be what, how do you treat the roof um, fitting in between these hipped roofs? Um, again, this, this happens to show the existing pathway there, which we wouldn't want to do. How do you treat this front facade? And what is the mass of this building relative to the mass of the original building, the treatment of the windows? So I, I totally agree with you. That the design, especially from the exterior perspective of this complex, will the have HTC, to... see, of course, has no say about what happens on the inside. And technically, we have very little say about the outside. It would be great to... But I think it's there. important. It's an important component of the process and to make sure that we get input and feedback to, so that whatever is built is yep. respectful. Looks like you're moving down the right path, okay. at least speaking as one member of the HTC. Yes, please. Um, it's been a while since we saw the full report, uh, and I think we talked about the driveway the way that it is now and looked at options of the driveway coming in differently, and there was certainly limitations with the driveway coming in off of Great Road. Yeah. But I, can you refresh my memory what the options are, and in particular, do you run into issues with how the driveway is now? I often see buses there and kids there, and um, you know, I can imagine that where the cars are coming in and out of there, um, that's not the best situation. And then my second part is parking. Um, so there's just a couple of spots right there where the handicap spots are. And if those get filled up, the overflow obviously is over on the other side. Is there any ever issues with 
and a parking. I don't know what you could do with right. my problems, right. but. Um, so, so hopefully um, with the new design, um, those problems will be eliminated. So in the beginning, there was talk of those are all issues. Mm -hmm. um, we've been fortunate. So it's really not an ideal situation to have a public safety complex with one means of egress mm -hmm. um, and entrance rate. So um, it would be ideal um, post 9-11 um, from a safety perspective um, if we blocked a truck at the front of our entrance, um, our cruise is a landlocked, right? Um, so it would be an ideal situation to have a driveway that exited out towards the Great Road. Um, and with that, the potential for increased parking for police vehicles, which if we did take option C, would eliminate a couple of spaces, right? Um, mm -hmm. From the generator being moved outside, as well as where car one and car four park, we'd lose at least three spaces. So to have additional parking and a means of egress onto the Great Road um, in the 21st century would make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Can it be done? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, there are some, uh, I, I think Tassir knows more about the actual driveway, but mm -hmm. conceptually, yes, I think that can all happen, but I think there's some details to yeah. that plan. <clears throat> but just to really emphasize on your point, Caroline, if a delivery truck pulled in and broke down, no one mm -hmm. can leave. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's why it's really important to have sure. that. <clears throat> so we've been working actually, we've had a couple of meetings with uh, Eversource on relocating the falls and keeping the landscaping and the emergency generator. We're trying to get, in fact, a second utility source from NSTAR so that we're not relying on a natural gas emergency generator. We would have two NSTAR or Eversource uh, power feeds. Mm -hmm. uh, so just to... Yeah, it's doable. I think there's some utility work that needs to take place without really impacting too much of the landscaping. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be used just as an emergency, you know, exit for the police cars. Mm -hmm. And so it's yeah, not just a, a normal second traffic. Being a yeah. 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 So, so just to clarify the positioning of the either one or two additions, depending on option B has one and option C has two, um, doesn't really affect what we do with the landscaping in that regard. We could still work out our driveway needs regardless of which option we chose, presumably. Yeah, the driveway would still work. I, I think what the chief referred to is there is some parking that is inside this one here right. that you would lose with that other that second addition. Well, right, and, and I think one of the reasons why it it came up again is because another idea, if you couldn't come from the front of the building to Great Road, to the side, if you couldn't extend to Great Road, you know, kind of continuing on the driveway that's there to Great Road, um, could you come off the side of the building to Mudge Way, where the new addition is on one of these? I just didn't, so if the answer was no, there's no way to get to Great Road with a second means of egress, could you then, as a plan C, go sideways on Mudge Way? So, we, well, I think if you the idea great road, is get to Great Road. To get to Great Road. Yes, of course. That's the right. concept, yes. Okay. Yeah, great. Thank you. And can I just clarify, because I do have the 2015 plans in front of me, that nothing has changed with those options, or has anything changed? Well, just uh, the cost. Yeah. Well, no, no, I saw that, the 5% escalator. The I, have the, and I think it's also important to note, um, although the conceptual designs haven't changed, one of the things that we should mention is that we've been experiencing some mechanical failures. Mm -hmm. So as we're doing this mm -hmm. renovation, it would only make sense, as the walls were exposed, that we look at the mechanical systems within the building. So that's probably changed as well. And yeah. I know Tassir has put a lot of effort into studying that with Jeff. Yeah, so when the study was done, it was really focused mainly on the space needs. We did not look at the mechanical systems. Uh, the same thing like the library. They have a chiller outside the, the police building. It's turned on in the summer, turned off uh, in the winter. Uh, they have to drain it, so if you need it in September, it's too late. Once it's, it's drained, you're dead. <laughs> uh, they have heat pumps that will have nothing but issues. Mm -hmm. and really, a couple of detectives offices that were out of business for some time, for a month, until we get replacements. Uh, so there are, <coughs> and this is really an opportunity for us, again, to be more efficient, to drive towards the 2040 goal. This is, you're, like the chief said, you're opening the walls. And it just becomes, it's on our 
capital fund to do new mechanical, but why not do it just now? Yeah. So that's built into all the options. That must be built into every option. It will be, yeah, yes. Because it, you would get new mechanical systems. I'd like to, go ahead. Well, I guess, what, what year is, uh, is that in the capital plan? I'll have to look, but uh, I want to say five, six years from now. Yeah. Six years so from now. So it's the last, probably, yeah. But would there, would there be some swapping that has to go then? Swapping. So, if you, or something if, else out to if bring you, that If you're in. trying to keep it level, no. I mean, if you bring it in, I think there's there's have been some movement on the capital plan in year four and year five. If you look out, I think the other part is that the design takes a significant period of time. I mean, but even if we accelerate it, there are not many things that we can accelerate in the interim. I mean, you could potentially move it up a year, but we'd have to look. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like to talk about a problem that we have as selectmen and that we have as design that's this historic society who occupies space in there and our ability to do what would be the best design which is to have the historic society out of there um, resides in part with uh, our discussing with them moving into old town hall which we already voted to make it the focus for a museum and the fact that the historic society has a um, mandate i guess i'd call it from the town meeting from 1952 or something that that the the stearns building would be their their um, headquarters and that if they're going to move to to old town hall which we have a letter from them back in August, September, September, I think, that we've never really officially uh, responded to. It says they're willing to go to uh, the first floor in Old Town Hall, but they're not willing to abandon this building until they know they're, that the whole museum situation is going to be put together. They are a bunch of, of uh, volunteers working within their organization. And I, from what I read here uh, to see uh, the work that this architect's going to do or some other architect's going to do is going to take, uh, it's going to occur in the next five or six months. And if, in order to come to a final plan and to decide whether, ideally, whether we're going to go with a uh, meet future needs or just meet current needs without the historic society there we need to get them off the mark and i guess what i'd like to do we we as selectmen haven't done this yet but i'd like to um, have the selectmen agree that it'd be appropriate for uh, myself and uh, mike to begin discussions not negotiations per se but just to get this process going it, it just seems to keep on languishing and going out we need to get it going and I'm happy to have input but I don't think I think we may end up with the historic society ending up there by default because nothing so I feel so we did um, authorize these you know discussions to move forward uh, regarding the I thought museum. We did do, uh, I thought yeah, yeah. absolutely. Is it is it the placement in Old Town Hall that's I heard the last thing I heard was people didn't want to do anything till we got a business plan and they are dragging their feet on doing that. And we can still talk to them about it. I mean, I, I think what we're, what we're trying to do, and if I'm remembering correctly, the discussion that we had when we were talking about the museum, yep. was that we're trying, we have a series of dominoes, and one of them has to go first. And so by committing ourselves to negotiating in good faith with the historical society to move into Old Town Hall, subject to the negotiation of lease agreements, of space, of operational issues, and other things, but making the commitment that at very least um, they could move in anticipation of a museum project going forward at Old Town Hall, and we can begin our discussions about the, the terms of, of that relationship that we'd have if they moved into into Old Town Hall. That would allow us to take a meaningful step towards deciding which one of these options we wanted to pursue. Because as far as I was concerned, we were saying that 
with the museum study having the preferred option of the museum being an old town hall, that was the natural first domino to move to liberate the space in the police department so that we could go forward with our planning. Now I know that all of the T's aren't crossed and the I's aren't dotted and the historical society may feel as though they still want to have the assurance that they have the space, but they will have the space to a certain extent while this process moves forward. We're not going to kick them out tomorrow because we're engaging architects to No, we're not going to kick them plans. out tomorrow, but they're not prepared to say that they will move out even yeah. if they move in. I don't know if we can kick them out. That's their position, that they, we can't kick them out, although I suspect the town meeting could kick well, them out. Well, I don't, I don't think that, I, I don't think it's very helpful to talk about this in terms of them yeah. being kicked out of the building. No. I feel as though we are in all good faith trying to meet the needs of our public safety uh, and our police department, while at the same time respecting the historical society's needs to have a certain level of space and appropriate exhibit and you know artifact uh, conditions in in a publicly owned building, and I feel as though we have to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time and to commit ourselves to doing this. Uh, hey, then I apologize if I misunderstood our last conversation because what I heard was you didn't want to do anything more until they gave us a business plan. Well, so I'll, I'll limit my comments, but there's a lot of them. Um, the historical society's space that they have at the police station now can move to Old Town Hall. What the discussions are waiting for the business plan is regarding the museum. Correct. So those are two separate items. Not, there is a, not in their mind. I understand. But there is a space available at Old Town Hall that can house the historical society as it functions today. I'm not right. against moving forward with them, but I think that as a board, we need to walk and chew gum and keep our priorities correct. And so this is a public safety building, and if one of the first dominoes has to be that that space is freed up, in good faith of exploring whether the museum would end up at Old Town Hall or not, that's okay. That can follow along its normal process of every other space need in town. It, there's a process, it needs a business plan. What we don't need a business plan for is to move the historical society from X square feet here to X square feet there. And I understand that maybe there's some resistance to that, but we, I, I think the whole, we're not gonna move unless you approve a museum isn't in good faith. That doesn't feel in good faith to me. They sent us a letter said that they're willing to move. I think that's what we but, all agreed. But not to. abandon this building. Oh, I, I, okay, so. They're willing to move, but they're not willing to abandon this building. Well, under no circumstances were they going to be able to have a museum in this building. No, they would never have anything they would more never, than they have. Right, and so I think in the interests of all, uh, all of us keeping our eye on the ball, which for the historical society is they want a museum, and for the police department, they need the space, uh, that we find a way to accelerate these conversations Good. and say and say to the historical society, the space in the first floor of the town hall, old town hall, is available to overtime because again, this is not happening, not happening tomorrow. No, it won't happen. Um, no, but what the design we, have, we saw, we saw, we. I know we have to make a decision about how to move forward with design. We saw a timeline that Tisir you put together, and so what year are you talking about this actually happening? So we take you through this. First of all, we have to really still advertise for the RFP. By the time we select an architect and start looking into it, you're looking at three, four months. Uh, that's one. Number two is just to remind you, though, this Thursday night we go in front of the CPC. We're asking for funding to start the renovation work at Old Town Hall because we did not renew the leases uh, in anticipation that we would do the first floor and the third floor so that things can move. I thought that was our understanding. And Don Corey and I are coming this Thursday night in front of CPC to ask for funding to do that project. But you're looking at really six months back to the police project before you can see any really, even the minor design. The in terms of designing, we're going to yeah. have to, if we follow this timeline, right. we're going to have to mm -hmm. come up with, with whether the historic society yeah. is part of this design or not by right. late summer. 
It, correct, but even if we were to have the contract ready and we hire a con construction contractor, we can start actually doing the additions first before we really start the renovation work. That's what we do on the yeah, but we, but we want to. We need to decide what what we want this to be. Okay, we I have to commit ourselves to a path. We're recommending option C because yeah. that's really what's needed uh, regardless. Uh, but there is time, there is six months to nine months at least before uh, the historic society can move out. Yeah. Well, but we need, to, we need to decide that that's going to happen. Yes. So, so we, we want to do that now. I'm hearing very clearly, well, hang on. I'm hearing very clearly mm -hmm. that, that this board would assumed, apparently contrary to what I understood, that we should have those discussions as soon as possible in an ongoing way. About, yes, about the relocation of the Historical Society offices and storage and the, the space that they're occupying at the police station to Old, Old Town Hall in anticipation of this. They've already said they're willing to move. Right, so so we have to, so I, I think that that's something, I, I feel as though that's something that we agreed to. Yeah. And so all that is left for uh, us to do. Go ahead, I'm sorry. All that is left for us to do regarding this particular project is to make a determination of what the, the right choice is for the police station. It, it does box us in a little bit with our negotiations to a certain extent by saying, look, we're, we've, you know, we're obviously, we're redesigning away the space at the police station at the Stearns building and so that puts more you know pressure on us to come to some sort of agreement with the historical society that is mutually agreeable but we were going to do that anyway we legitimately want them to have a space that's appropriate for them but I don't think that we can uh, hold off on this project if we're going to be able to meet a reasonable time I'm not frame. asking us to hold off but I'm I, apparently I'm not making clear we need to have all the ducks lined up and everybody agreed, not only that they're going to move over there into the first floor, but that there will be a museum in there that we're happy, no, I'm telling you, the Historic Society is not moving out of the Stearns building. They might move in some of their operations over to Old Town Hall, but they are not going to desert Old Town Hall, I mean, uh, Stearns building until the museum is affirmed. And that we're, we've got an operating agreement with them about how that museum will operate. The motion that all now. has to happen before August, September, if we're going to design the place for not having the museum there. The motion that was approved on October 15th says that uh, the selectment approved designating Old Town Hall as the proposed location for a museum subject to negotiations with the historical system. So I think that even though the, it was stated that we're going to need input from them, I think that's we where got the, the green light the to business dump. plan came. But I, but I don't think we're, I don't, I don't think, I mean it's contingent on, on successful negotiation, but we can do that. Okay, I just, I guess I misunderstood. Yeah. I just want to return this issue to the actual needs of the police C. department, <laughs> right, and the distinct and distinguishing between option B and option C. And I appreciate that we're being asked to look at the long-term needs of the police department because I do think this is something that, um, you know, we've touched on lightly in different uh, different venues in town government about whether or not our staffing of the police department is what it should be to serve the needs of the town. And if we're looking to the future and saying that staffing might be different or the utilization of the space might need to be different depending upon you know projections of future staffing needs I think it's um, it's incumbent upon us to take the action that will make this building last as long as possible without then finding ourselves in a position of having outgrown it so I would support doing a little bit of the reach um, to the future future needs to meet the future needs and I, I agree and I'll, I'll just say it's a very conservative reach 2,000 mm -hmm. square feet is just One not a lot. Oh, from 26 to 4. I'm oh, sorry. Right. Well, less, less than. Seven, two, right. Seven, it's a seven. it's a small reach. It's not a, a huge ask um, for space. Just. If, if I might follow up on uh, selective placements, 
uh, assessment. So simultaneously, the manager and I are working in other entities with a consultant to really look at our uh, staffing levels, if they meet the 21st century, if they meet the needs of the community. Um, we've begun that work and that work will be presented to you in the future, but I do anticipate that if the community wants the level of service that our police department is currently providing, that will be an increase in staffing. Um, so um, what that number is will obviously um, need to be discussed by the powers to be, uh, but preliminarily, um, we're looking at anywhere, you know, from three to six positions um, to meet the needs of the community again, with respect to traffic, uh, with respect to um, the increase of, of in, in our schools with school resource officers, and the need to put more police officers on the street uh, as the town grows. So there um, uh, probably will be some growth that comes out of this the study. Just how much? will certainly be open for uh, discussion. Does option C give you the the space needed for what you're anticipating coming back from this? Yeah, so um, we actually did talk about staffing originally back when the study was done and then recently when I updated the costs uh, figures as well just to confirm that from the chief's perspective in those conversations that have been had, what those staffing numbers were and how they impacted the plan. Many of the positions the chief's talking about um, in some cases only affect the locker room size or the roll call size, which has some capacity in it um, because you know a police officer that's out on a beat um, needs locker space, but they don't necessarily need an office mm -hmm. in, in the building. Mm -hmm. So small space increases are already are accounted for okay. for them. So we, you heard support for option C and uh, I'll, well, I'll second that support. With this, now with looking at what you're gonna do, this supposedly is a 20 year generation addition. Would this change any of that in terms of additional space? With what you're, what you're planning to do now, what changes you're gonna make? Does it still last a generation or? Yeah, no, the, the, the anticipation for staff growth was incorporated into the space needs when we originally done it, and we just confirmed that the staffing was appropriate for what the conversations are currently ongoing as well. So basically we confirmed the last, the study that we did, and that projects out 20 years. 20 years, um, okay. <clears throat> we'd like to be able to project 50 years because <laughs> it's unlikely you're gonna go back and do more work, but um, it's it's very challenging to try to envision what technology will be available, what things the police department yeah. will be doing. I mean, if so. you look at it, it was done 22, tw roughly 22 years That's right. thereabouts. Yeah. So it lasts Your, a generation. It's, it's no different than a school project going out, you know, you can only do enrollments 10 years because you don't even know what kids are born at this point. And you, you don't know what the what the change is necessarily going to be in, in any of the, the, the functions that we perform today. Trying to project out 20 years with everything and, and sort of this uh, uh, change thing that, that's going on, disruption of, of almost every function we do based on you know technology that's going on. But a 20-year horizon, as long as it satisfies a 20-year horizon, then I'm okay with that kind of kind of view. Uh, I wouldn't want to say in five years, oh, we didn't build enough space. Mm -hmm. because yeah, and we had that conversation almost in the first meeting that we talked about because one of the um, advantages of coming back to a building that you design is you get to ask the chief, well, how fast did you actually run out of this space? Because, you know, you're asking for, for more space. We did the original study, so about 20 years ago, like you're saying, um, it's coming back. And, and so I think there are some lessons learned always every time you do a project, mm -hmm. but um, seeing what, how they've used the building and seeing what the needs are, it's pretty, um, I would say, it's tracking along the right trend. That you know, As they brought on new programs, they're part of the original design and taken over space. There was a storage room or there was areas that they, they've, they've sort of busted at the seams. And that generally is what happens as um, mandates are given to local PDs, local fire departments, that there 20 years ago, so right. that's, that's what's happening. Right. Yeah, I mean, the only risk is we overbuild and, you know, the policing function or the uh, whatever other functions we do are no longer required. Yeah. But, <laughs> I mean, that happens all the time. You put a little museum in the extra. <laughs> oh, you know what I am. <laughs> <laughs> 
Any other questions, concerns, so hearing comments? So it's just in support yeah, was, for option from, C. Yeah, I was going to say from the memo that Mr. Lani gave us, it sounds like what we're being asked to do is to endorse an option. Yeah, the design um, is funded for right. two years ago. And so I, I would make a motion to endorse option C to allow us to move ahead with the project. Second. I'll second it. Any other comments? I, I guess we all understand after my diatribe that, that this is subject to, C is subject to successfully getting the historic district, historic society out of the Stearns building. We have a motion and I have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 No oppose. Motion's carried 5 0. It's exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In the cards. Cash cards, recycle cards out there. Miss Stanton. So we are um, a little behind schedule, but the refuse and recycling review contract is free tonight. We do have some sights and sounds to see. So if you want to look at the proposed toters, they are in the hallway, which is the rumbling that you heard earlier. Um, Just bring them in. Yeah. You can bring them in. Yeah, bring them in so people can, can see. Them in. You can bring them in. Um, on the uh, want to on table on yeah meeting on, on um, so as you know from the last time that we talked about this there are some potential options in terms of adjusting the size of the proposed toters related to the new republic contract i'm just gonna wait for this chaos to come in hmm. That's the 48. We thought it would be helpful to have some visual reminders of mm -hmm. what the potential options would be. Um, That's a 60. The larger option happens to be what I use at home, and I find it to be quite enjoyable. Um, so <laughs> they're going to uh, talk about a couple of the options related to the contract and the contract negotiations. I think it's important to note one thing. The main challenge that is surrounding the ability to meet the FinCom guideline of 2.5% is this contract. So there are some other larger items that are weighing in as well, but this is a main, main budget driver for this year. So I want to make sure that you're clear on the cover sheet about the cost relating to this and the level of service expected in this contract. Um, but Regita and Ed are going to do an update on some, Ed has some updates just in general, um, but also just an overview of where we're at in the contracting process and then the potential options before you. Good evening, everybody. Um, so we are here just to present updates, as Sarah mentioned, um, with the new contract. Our current contract is expiring in June um, of this, this year, 2019. And um, so we were going over all the changes we wanted to do with the new contract, which will be for the next five years. Um, so some of them, most of them are in the specifications area, like, you know, we wanted to make sure there's more communication from the contractor to the town uh, so we can we can respond to public risk, public questions um, uh, appropriately, record keeping. A um, couple of uh, main things are automated recycling, uh, as we had presented in the October meeting. Um, so we went back, talked to a few people um, from the, um, from Republic as well as other companies, and uh, what we've not noticed is they highly recommended a 64-gallon capacity cart. Uh, as you see, that's the difference between a 48 and a 64. Um, Which is not as large as you would think. Multiple factors uh, played into that. Um, one is they said, you know, 48-gallon carts are usually top-heavy. Uh, recycling is lighter than trash, so it tends to fall in the wind. Um, the other main factor is uh, we, c we could potentially get a mass DEP grant if we go with the 64 gallon cart versus if we go with 48, we, we won't we won't be eligible for it. Um, so I've kind of listed out all the uh, all the factors in the memo. So I'm gonna just quickly go one by one. Um, the first in the in the memo is just the anticipated and estimated cost between FY19 and FY20. Um, we've uh, We've put together, you know, the base price and uh, a couple of changes, as I had mentioned, like, you know, the white goods collection is uh, another one that's uh, new. Um, they're not, they're not going to be rolled up in the base fee as we had in the past. Um, there's a lot of uh, significant difference in the recycling market. So these are all the things that are coming up now uh, with the new contract. The food waste collection is something that we wanted to start out as a pilot program. Um, we've identified around six locations. We're thinking of the schools, the fire department. Um, 
and the town center. Um, and uh, so the, the estimate we got for that is about you know $16.50 for every dump, which will include a relining of the cart. Um, so you know we estimate around $9,000 per year based on that. Um, if we do about 10 carts in the six locations. Um, so I've also included, um, so, so basically as Sarah mentioned, so when you line those uh, items up, uh, the difference in cost is around uh, six to seven percent. We don't know. We, we are doing a lot of estimations on uh, especially the white goods area and a couple of other things. So we are thinking that's the that's the estimated percentage increase between the FY19 and 20. Um, so I have more details on what the cost uh, differences are. You know, why is it that we are paying more um, for the recycling processing? Um, how is that calculated? All of that is in uh, page two and a bit of three. Um, so if you had any questions or if you had reviewed it the, uh, prior to the meeting, please feel free to interrupt me at, at any point. Some of this was discussed at the last meeting, so we knew that the cost of recycling was coming up, right? It really into the China sword and everything associated with that. The other part is that Bedford has an exemplary service delivery expectation in their waste management contract. We have same day pickup, which is it does not come in at insignificant cost. There's a heavy capital investment associated if you choose to do same day pickup. Um, and I think we also have a pretty high quality of service. And because of that, there are very few companies that have interest in um, or the ability to execute this contract. So Regita and David and the whole team have done a lot of work on sort of how do we make sure that we're keeping that level of service, but also how do we look at ways to potentially cut costs, how do we look at grant opportunities. The 48 to the 65 is a new change. We thought the visual would be helpful just to show that it's not you know, David and Goliath, it's not so terrible side by side, but that is one option that would give an alternative funding source to potentially be able to offset some of this. Yeah. To steal Regita's thunder. Can I just ask, because I'm just looking at these commodity prices and looking at the cost slash revenue sharing system that, uh, you know, we have, um, is there any, it's, you know, it seems like some of the more um, valuable commodities are the ones that represent the lowest percentage of the amount, the volume, or I don't know if that's, is that by weight. By weight. Um, so I, and I guess that makes sense because obviously steel weighs a lot less than, than plastic. But nonetheless, if you've got high commodity price prices for certain items, um, does it make sense to alert Bedford residents to what these items are? Like I had to go and Google to find out what natural HDPE and what colored HDPE. Yeah. Turns out that's number two recycling. It's like my milk jug, right? So, um, you know, if people knew that that was a more desirable item to yeah, be in the recycling, item, item. right? Like, and obviously people know about the aluminum cans and that sort of makes sense to people because there's a deposit on it, but also the PET is another one. You know, if you've got commodity prices at $840, what is that, a ton? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, that would be good information to share with residents to say, hey, you know, don't throw those things away. Yeah. yeah. To that point, we're actually planning to put stickers on, on the lids of all, e either of the carts. Mm -hmm. um, That's a good idea. So to advertise, you know, what's recyclable, what's not. Yeah. Yes. And, and also to have a uh, an audit um, every quarter from Republic to give it back to us for Bedford. What's, what's the composition of Bedford? Get back to the town level and then let us know what's the what's the percentages we're outputting and you know how are we doing with market values. Yeah. A lot of it is a, pub, is a public education campaign, right? So if mm -hmm. you Google that information, you were able to find it out. We have the recycling toters like this in Salem and the cover literally reminds me of what I can put in there and what I should not be putting in there. Yeah. And right. So some of it is just retraining people on recycling is good, but it's a little bit more nuanced than just the initial recycling is good. Yeah. Yeah. Just and like how the plastic it's ongoing. bags. It's ongoing. Right. Yeah. You know, I'm still telling, I still get a couple calls a day and I would get rid of the sofa, both ways. Right. So, you know, right. it's, 
just, just keep I think there's definitely confusion about what is and isn't recyclable, but this kind of goes one step further to what is financially beneficial people to the town, right? And I think that actually people will find that motivating. Now, I'm, looking, yeah. I'm looking to do something on the website to take this type of graph chart and, and get it so right. it's understandable. Totally. I'll bring home aluminum cans for my parents' house. You are doing a <laughs> PSA with Bedford TV as well. Yeah, we're working on a PSA with for both ways and going to be doing other ones. And, and we're going to be changing. Um, we just, I have two grants from the past two years uh, from the DEP, the Recycled Dividend Program, $4,800 each year. So I have about $9,600 of DEP money. And I have a broad range of what I can do with. And I'm going to be doing outreach, as I did with those postcards for the holiday, about trash collection around Christmas and New Year's, etc. And a postcard. I'm it was gonna, great. I'm going to be doing that more often because even as much as I put it on the web, we put it on Facebook, wherever I, I still run into people, I didn't hear about this. So I figured I'm going to send it to your house. So I'm going to increase the mailings. Uh, from here with more information. So if people say that you know, I, I, you know, I don't know what else to do. So. I don't. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Let me get the Boy Scouts to go door to door. <laughs> I'm, I, I, I'm still concerned about the size of that toter, especially in terms of older people. And I remember when we had this conversation when we went to the trash container. And I thought 48 was a great compromise and I think it's working out. I don't see that many blue bags around. I think what will happen is if older people or other people who have trouble managing the large one, they just won't bother to recycle it all. So you can get a smaller one. That's the other option. So you, with the way that we worked it in Salem, it would be the same way here. The default is the larger toter. If you are not able or elderly or there's a reason, you can go with the smaller toter. Surprisingly, the larger toter, not that much heavier or less nimble than the 40 it's the same sort of function of like you put your foot on the pedal you push it forward and also recycling is lighter recycling is lighter mm -hmm. so i mean there is you could default you could request a smaller toter mm -hmm. so right now tonight what we need we're looking to get the okay to go forward with the 64 gallon car we're looking at about 4500 homes in bedford there are going to be some, it's going to be too big. We understand that. There are going to be some, it's not big enough. They're going to need an extra car. But for most of, the, most of the households, that's going to suffice. And what we, we need to get rolling because there's a four to five month lead time to <laughs> get 4,500 of these made and to get the contract finalized and stuff like that. So we, we're looking to move forward. And we're, we're, we, we, we know, I mean, I've talked to the, I talk, I go to the council on aging, I, I know. There are some people, this is not going to be good. And we will address that and we'll develop a plan. For instance, if we come up with a second recycling cart and we're going to treat it as a second trash cart, is there a fee associated with it? We haven't done any of those calculations, haven't appealed that on yet at all. But recycling costs money now. Three years ago, it was zero. Right, so I, I actually said here, I'll give you a second car because we were making money yeah. on the materials. Well, that's not the case anymore. So we need to we need to come up with a program. But talking, we were talking as a team. It's easier for us right now. This is going to suffice for most of the households in town, yeah. right? We need to get going and get this ball moving forward. And we can come in with a program for a second cart, if need be, or a smaller cart. We, we have the flexibility. And we're talking about doing that this spring once we get past the contract. It's also compared it with other municipalities. And most of them are doing a 64 or above uh, for recycling. Let, let me be clear about a couple things. One is the larger cart, you prefer the larger cart just because for monetary reasons? You, well, need, to buy, you need to get your cardboard in there. Well, right we, now the guy gets out. I get my cardboard in a in a pit that big now. You, it's got to fit in here. Well, it fits in that pit. Not for not for most people. You have to cut it. You have to break it down. You have to cut it up, and that's the challenge. And, and that's why I said you've got to go for the bigger car. Okay, so it's no, not. It's a box. It's a box it, thing. The vast majority of people don't want to take the time to. So, no, cut. I have too, or too much. 
It also gets okay. top heavy. So it's 48. Is there any difference in the way either of those containers could handle? Could one use a 48 gallon container instead of a 64 and still have it picked up? Yeah. 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 So, so, so it would not matter. So we could offer to the townspeople a choice of the 64. So I think you want to be careful there. So that's where you say the default is 64. But if you are not able or, or there's a challenge, you go to the 48. No, no, no. Or for instance, I don't want the big one. I can't get it in my garage. I want a, I want the smallest one. So then you would request. But I'm totally system. able to use the. No, but there's, a, there's management issues here. And I just want to be sure. Much, I All I want to do is. I, I perfectly said, but then I'm looking at it from the town side. I have to have, where do I store these? extra recycling cards because they're not going to be black they're going to be a different color where do we store why do they why do they have to be a different color so it's for city so it says differentiated from trash yeah. i think so there's no other way to market in an, we have green in the and blue. ideal scenario and i've been in two communities that have done this and transitioned from a smaller to a large from no recycling to a recycling with a sticker to this the idea is that you pick a default so if you I have no problem with picking a sure. default. So when you pick a default, you order a standardized amount, you order a small supplemental background, some potentially smaller as a backup. There's typically a longer lead time to get the smaller because it's not ordered as part of the larger bunch. The other part with the smaller is they get top heavy and they tip. Yes. So if you are going with the, this has more weight on its meteor. With this, if you stack it, it tips. Not always, but it can. It's just the way that it's built. And also 48 is more likely to tip, which is why we don't encourage the 48, you encourage the 64. Tip where? So it tips forward. The recycling, the because, recycling. It's recycling. because it's not Trash is heavy. weighted. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I have to say, you know, as long as, as far as I'm concerned, if the town has a, a posture of being helpful to the residents, if they have an issue, mm -hmm. and addressing that issue in a reasonable, with a reasonable uh, solution. solution. <laughs> um, I I have no problem with the bigger item. I you know I've, personally I'd like them to be the same size because it fits into the space better. Mm -hmm. But I totally get the reasons why the bigger one would be preferable. And also because we're looking at an, such a substantial increase in this cost, if we can get a grant for them, you know I, I think that's a reasonable reason to move forward with that alone, you know, to say that we could potentially recoup some of the cost. Yeah. Um, and I think as long as the posture is one of if some, you know, some individual for whatever reason does not want the default item that we will try to be accommodating to them, I, I don't have a problem with that. I think to your response though, Bill, you don't want to give the option out of the gate. So you don't want to say to a street, do you prefer 40 mm -hmm. or 64? Because that's where you get the ordering conundrum. The, the idea of default is that you order a mass amount of the default and then you have a smaller number opt -out. of, of, of opt-out. I have a, uh, a summer home where they use the 64 and I don't use it down there be and it works because I don't have anyone. I take it to the local tip yeah. uh, whenever I feel like it yeah. to do recycling. Do we have the ability to do that here in town? No. No. No ability to have people take it to to some location. You gotta have it staffed. You can't leave it unattended. I mean, that's why I stood out there December 26th. The Thank you for doing that. I was gonna end with that. Yeah, that's your husband. I understand, <laughs> you, I understand you also took styrofoam. Yeah, we did. But I had to make sure. What did you do with the styrofoam? In the trash. The, go the goats eat it. Oh, no, I'm saying <laughs> The goats eat it. Oh. That. That's a whole other That's a whole thing. I don't want to go there. I just. Take another point about the 64. The state grant program, because we're at 48 gallon trash. Trash. Tank, Right? We are eligible for a $15 per cart grant. It has to be a 64 gallon cart, mm -hmm. not a small one. And nobody in the state goes below 64 gallons for recycling. I've done the research, I looked at the towns we benchmark. Anyone who does weekly curbside recycling, it's 64 or greater. Sometimes change is uncomfortable. Wait, how much, how much, what's the capacity of the ones we use now? 18 gallon, wow. 18 gallon, the gray bins or 18 gallon bins. But footprint wise, two of those bins will be probably bigger than the 64, for example. 
You, I, want, you want the black one to be full and people to think to recycle more. You want more space in the blue. You want it to appear bigger because we're doing this more. It's a visual thing too. It's I think, like, and, and yeah, and I think to your point that you know that the 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 psychology of it is to encourage people to recycle. Yeah. And um, I think that we heard concerns. I I got concerns from older people saying give us the cart because we can't lug around those yeah. bins. bins anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And then we also heard on the other side uh, that bin looks too big. I think we just have to make a decision. I think our staff has given us a recommendation of something that seems very reasonable. Um, I feel as though the financial incentive that the state is prov providing us is one that totally justifies going to the larger yeah. cart. And if we, you know, if someone comes with a problem, we trust our staff to be sensitive, to be helpful to them. Okay. The only the only thing I want to make sure is that people who would not like a cart that large for whatever reason they may choose, not because they're physically disabled, right. for whatever reason, can get a cart that is 48 <coughs> what I'm saying, at no extra cost. Right. What I'm saying tonight is we need to get the okay to go forward on the 64 for the 4,000 or so homes that are going to use that. Then the subsets, the small, who want a smaller cart or who might want an additional cart, we need to come up with the programs, how we're going to fulfill those cards, how we're going to meet those needs. We haven't done any we need to focus on. I this. understand. I, just, it's on the, I guess it's on the list. Isn't but it? I'm saying my, my willingness to go along with 64 is contingent on no additional cost to, to somebody who wants a smaller one, yeah. at least for the initial barrel. No additional cost in the sense of no additional cost for the... They should get it as free as... He doesn't want a penalty. Yeah. Yeah, right. Can I... To your Please. Response. Everyone's going to be entitled to one recycling cart, similar to the way they're entitled to one trash cart. Right. So whether the recycling cart is 64 gallons, 48, or 35, whatever we come up with, you're going to, you're going to get that one cart. Now, if you want an additional one... No, I thought I heard you earlier say, well, if we have smaller carts, we're going to have to charge for them. No, if we had someone wanting a additional. second... A second oh, a second one, I understand. No problem. That's what we're talking about. If, and if I could, the... the, the, uh, the FY19, we're not dragging any of the carts cost through the through that cost. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what you sent me? And this year, or FY20, FY19, I believe, uh, carries the refuse carts. Does carry the FY20? That was before I got here when they got no, it. Does not. Oh, does not. Does not. Okay, so FY20, I think we, we, in the earlier presentation, you told us it was 225 for the carts? Approximately. Over five years? Yeah. 50000 So that would be about $45,000. Mm -hmm. So of the 10%, 9.5% increase, 5% of it is just for that cart. Year over year increase. But yeah. yeah right. So it's about four and a half percent increase. Should sell ads. Yeah. Should sell ads yeah. on the card. Mm -hmm. And the only thing, speaking about numbers, so our. Our, what's being proposed here is a variable number. So you will have a final contract before you. No, but I meant there are numbers here. The, the 974 is is a fixed based number, and then it starts getting variable. So we're still working through those numbers. The only thing before you tonight is the size of the toters. We'll be back next month to talk about the final agreement contract. to be signed. That's still being worked through. The ordering process, or at least the triggering process, to say to Republic, yes, big toter versus medium toter. Is the conversation does, does the go big blue? Does the 974 include the fifteen thousand dollars of white goods collection? I don't know. No, no, separate. separate. So if we roll it in, one should add fifteen thousand to the 974. So yes, the total the page has is on the second page. So if you go to the second page. And you look at the total contract. It's well, I was trying to figure out what was in and what was out. It's a million twenty-eight. So everything listed here is Great. in category. So it consumes ninety thousand dollars for recycling and sixty for the grant as a payment back, and and approximately nine thousand dollars for a pilot program on Compl food waste. Yep. Do you want to talk about that now, or you want to wait until we? Sure, we can. Yeah. It's entirely up to you guys if you want to talk about composting now. You can. You can talk about. We're still negotiating through. I mean, you, you have. It. How does it work? So right now we're looking. 
we're, the one we're operating is setting up a pilot program at town center for Thursday night, the meal the food pantry puts on, the fire station because they're up, they're manned 24 seven, they have a kitchen, and my experience has been they cook, they're good cooks, and the four <laughs> school cafeterias. But this isn't like, you, I'm driving from my house with leftovers from dinner. And no, this is for these buildings. This is just institutions. This is for these institutions. Oh. That's the start. And then we're gonna move into it, whether we make- uh, Potentially. Potentially, we're, 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 meeting, we're meeting with Black Earth Compost to talk about what can be done. We, we, we've got the ball rolling in a couple different directions. Do we do a, if, do we do a drop off where at 108 Carlisle we set up a container similar to what you see at national parks that are bear proof where you can go and empty it if you want. Definitely. It's elective. Um, we're going to help out as we can the Mothers Out Front effort to recruit 300 uh, residents to join it. Um, so we're, we're, we're working towards that. It makes up, depending on who you look, it's 10 to 15% of the waste stream. You get that out of your trash. Now your trash is lighter. It's what about backyard composting? Is that, I mean that, that used to be a big thing. And it still is. We still, still have still, the bins. I go through about twenty. I sell about twenty-five compost bins a year. Yeah. Get a pig. <laughs> Just <kidding. laughs> That's back here with the composting. Two, two, two different I'm ways. On my way out, I will make my own pig chips. <laughs> a lot of it is feel good, Ed. So I have composting in Salem. We have curbside composting with Black Earth. Um, some of it is that it's an out, you pay a hundred dollars a year. It's not you have to pay it separate. It's not part of the city's <coughs> trash and recycling plan. You put it out once a week. You put eggs, eggshells in there, and oh, yeah, no, no, no. and it's a feel good effort more so. Cambridge has automatic curbside composting for the entire city, um, but they pay for it. Yeah, no, and I came up from the from the time where you put it out in your backyard, and the guy came with the what was then called the garbage truck and <laughs> picked up the thing, and you know, but. If I compare, this is for people who don't have garbage disposals, <coughs> presumably, or don't use them. So, for, for food waste, because otherwise I'll just throw the food waste into the, into the garbage disposal. But when it goes down the stream, and it goes to Deer Island, yep. what happens to it? Fertilizer. Fertilizer, so Part it, of the process, they make fertilizer at Deer Island, um, and it's part of that mix. That's where Cambridge is yep. going now, too. It, it's, it gets mixed in with the other waste, and they make it the fertilizer. So, so for, for for that side, there's no advantage or disadvantage to 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 doing this program. If I'm already disposal it, versus it, versus it, well, it's it, only a pilot. It is if it's going down the garbage sewage. disposal yeah. in the sewage. If it's going in the trash, now we have a different right. conversation. I think it's two things. One, oh, if it's going in the trash. There's also yeah, 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 but, there's yeah. also the issue of grease and other items going into the water mm -hmm. system that it, you probably don't want yeah. to be encouraging people to do as an from the environmental point of view. But the main driver is that generally people will put their heavier things. They're not going to sit there and feed all of their watermelon rinds into their garbage disposal, right? That's going into the trash. And if you think about the weight of the water in the watermelon rinds, which is my favorite example, that's costing us a lot of money in our Pigs tipping fees. But um, I, I thank you for taking the composting issue seriously and trying this pilot program out. Um, I do know that the Energy and Sustainability Committee is supportive of it and hoping to be able to uh, be helpful in any way in terms of um, providing any yeah. any help on the on the black earth side i think they generally wish for us to stay away from as much as possible turning it into um you know mixing in with making pellets and stuff yeah. out of it but nonetheless it sounds as though you're you're on top of it and and i do think that continuing to encourage people to do backyard composting because bedford we have large lots it's not like uh cambridge um people do have backyards composting is not that complicated i always say if anybody wants a composting tutorial i'll be happy to help them um, but you can start my next PSA. I'd be happy to. So you know, just continuing to let people know that you offer those uh, those composters and and we we subsidize them, correct? I mean, no, I, I, oh. no, I haven't been, but it's okay. using the money for other things. Okay, but they're well, not expensive. One of the one of the things I, I spoke told this day that I had um, you know the idea that some of the group homes in town here mm -hmm. they've, they've got four trash carts right now. Oh, maybe I'll use my grant money to help them get involved with this 
Black Earth yep. program, and maybe they yep. put some of their waste. And yeah, and that program, the people I know who are participating in it are highly satisfied with it because they, it. yeah, because they do take they do take meat and food scraps and things like that that you wouldn't want to put in a traditional compost bin. So. Well, one last question before we vote about 64 gallon uh, containers. If we, assuming we give you the go ahead tonight, what what would be your pl plans about dealing with providing 48 gallon? So right now, the first step is we get the approval is go ahead, finalize the contract with Republic Services, and back before the board in two weeks or yeah. three weeks, four weeks? Yeah, end of February. Yep. End of February. Okay, I've heard several days. Yeah, so. we've Okay. So, I uh, just wanted to add on the contract side. Really, this is an important step for us, as Regita was saying, because it allows, it opens up a grant opportunity to allow us to better finalize the total costs, and because it's a long lead time item. So, this is one piece <coughs> that we'll look at, and then we'll be able to move forward with finalizing the other pieces as well. Thank you. So, in terms of once we finish the contract, your point. Okay, what do we do as we start going forward? We get this behind us. Can you address what do we do with people who need a second part? What's the program? What's a fair way of handling this? And then come well, up. I was thinking about the first cart. So you and do then come out. up with the second cart. What do we do if we want to opt out of the 54? We need to come up with a program. We just haven't had so time just, to do that. You just do an estimate. So just like with waste management or any other kind well, of. But I mean, if it takes. How many months does it take to order those? You can do it at the same time. So what we'd likely say to our public is we need 4,500 of this size. Please give us an estimate of what you think a oh, reasonable okay. number is. And then I, we I, produce as many of that size at the same time with the priority I, being get these Larry's done first. Thank you. And move on. Yes. Okay. So I'd be happy to make a motion to authorize the DPW to move ahead with our recycling contract with the 64-gallon cart. I would suggest a lovely Bedford Blue. Um, and so <laughs> we can... We can move ahead with our, our ordering and our all the rest of the contract negotiation. With the flag on it, too? I'll second that. <laughs> <laughs> Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion's carried 5 zip. Thank you. Thank you for all your hard work. Thank you for uh, the cardboard. Um, I can put in a plug for more opportunities for cardboard dumpsters. Yeah. No, I mean more often during the tier. Yeah. Yeah. And did you have, I'm sorry, Ed has two quick announcements. Two quick announcements. Number one, um, we, we're, we're in the big city here in the recycling world, and there were some issues up at the Merck today. The Republic got delayed. And so not everyone's recycling was picked up today. We got they are that. coming back first thing tomorrow morning. They know where they missed. So they're coming back tomorrow. And tomorrow starts um, the collection of Christmas trees, curbside collection of Christmas trees. And this is something I changed with Republic. Um, we went by voting precincts. So we're doing four days, every precinct's on a separate day this week. To me. And then um, we're, we're going to take a couple days, like we did for the last week of curbside uh, yard waste, let the dust settle. People don't have the tree, still have the tree for whatever reason. They still have a tree in front of their house. We're going to take that list. Next Wednesday, Republic will come back in town, go around and pick up all the stragglers. And they all go up to 108 Carlisle and they're chipped up and made into wood chips. Excellent. So that starts tomorrow, so people need to know they're voting and maybe there's a little civic. Is that on the town, <laughs> is that on the town website? It's on the town website. And it was on the, the DPW, it's website to the voting precinct map. And wasn't it on the card you sent out too? It was. Oh, not, no, that wasn't. We had to figure that out. It was on something. It was on something. I saw something, yeah. January 8th. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Great Thank you. work we have a bunch of miscellaneous action items. Yep, so you have um, miscellaneous action items of three. One is assigned from a request for the Bedford and Race Diversity um, MLK Community Breakfast on January 21st at 9.30 a.m. Also, um, some Chapter 268, Section 20 exemption employees, both of which require your approval. One employee. Um, so I move that uh, we approve the sign for the MLK breakfast, uh, the sign to be displayed, the two signs to be displayed from January 8th to the 21st. Second. Got a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion is carried five zip. And? I move that we um, 
mm, grant an exemption under Chapter 268, Section 20B for Cooper Waite. Second. Second. Pick your second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion is carried. Uh, the minutes of December 17th. Corrections, deletions, additions. I just want to point out that in the first page is a reference to volunteer coordinating committee interviews. And also also present are volunteer coordinating committee interviewees. It's the volunteer coordinating committee set this up. Oh. But the interviewees well, yeah. and the interviews are for town committee. Committee appointment interviews. Yeah. 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 On, and, oh sorry. Go ahead. Um a couple other things. Uh, page eight, top line, selectmen given information regarding the dog park. I think selectmen were given information about dog parks in other communities. Yep. Um, the, uh, and then under 19-116, first paragraph, um, three lines up from the bottom. The ZPA would open the public hearing and immediately deny the application as the property is above the 10% threshold for affordable housing. Um, I guess I guess that's right. I, I, I was going to ask, say, was the 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 town is already above I think the 10%? The town, yeah. Um, that, or, yeah, that, that's 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 why I marked it. And um, down on the paragraph that starts with Mr. Pierce stated that Hanscom to be sending a letter to the Conservation Commission. Um, it's not Hanscom, it's the, isn't it the Recovery Advisory Board? That's the RAB, right? That's Hanscom, RAB. But it's, I don't want to use the word Hanscom because that's, that's not accurate. It's not okay. Massport or the Air Force Base. It's, it's a different entity. But I think it's called the Hanscom RAB, isn't it? Well, if it is, the, you, you can use that yeah, together, but not just, advisory the, board. not yeah. just the word Hanscom. Mm -hmm. That's it. Uh, actually, in that same paragraph, I just wanted to clarify, just because it sounds... It sounds concerning and alarming the way it's written, and I'm not trying to say whether it is or isn't, but that wasn't the tenor of what was being said. Um, I, I think what Mr. Pierce, Pierce stated was that the letter would be sent to the Conservation Commission to clarify the situation regarding dioxin levels near the community gardens. Yeah. yeah. It sounds as though we found dioxin near the community gardens, and that's not what we're saying. Not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> I have one other one um, on page two, the paragraph one, two, three, four, five, the start, number six, paragraph six starts out with Mr. Cooper has been involved with the committee through his involvement with the American Legion. Mr. Cooper noted the, the committee member Gerald Hartman would be stepping down and encourage Mr. Cooper to apply. He can't be, he can't be Mr. Does it mean that Gerald Hartman encouraged Mr. Yes. Cooper? Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. now, we need, need to, some modifier there. Just Gerald Hartman, I guess. I have a, a quick question on page three in the middle. It says, as selectman liaison to the Trails Committee, Ms. Fleischman stated, I'm not the Trails Committee liaison, so I don't know who said that, but it wasn't me. Okay. Who is the Trails Committee liaison? Not me. Yeah. Not, not me. you. <laughs> I don't know. Well, um, maybe as the, as the liaison, just get to leave that. It's not me. Ms. Fle how about Ms. Fleischman stated? Did you say it? But I don't think I did because I'm not. How would I know? I don't know anything about that. That's Does anybody deal facetious. with trails here? Um, <laughs> Carolyn, were you here? Somebody said something, but it wasn't me. Yeah, I wasn't here, so I know it wasn't me. Yeah. Okay. All righty. I was missing a nutty. Any other corrections? <laughs> so we want to move at the... Uh, I move we accept the minutes of Monday, December 17th as amended. Website. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion That's is eight. carried. Four zero. Four, one. Four, one. Four zero one abstention. There Ms. is no liaison for the trails committee. Huh. So it was Eliza. We'll figure it out. Okay. You know, if you still have the recording, you can look it up. Whatever. 
Ms. Stanton, my the legs. floor is yours. So, uh, including your packets for some upcoming draft agendas for the month of January, it's pretty busy between preparing for budget and the budget vote on the 28th. Um, it should be noted that the old Bill Ricker Road update is set for next Monday evening. We have invited all the neighbors that came to the last meeting. We sent an email correspondence today encouraging them to come and to spread the word for those whose emails we did not have. I'm just giving everyone a heads up on that. Members from TAC and BAC will also be in attendance. Um, you'll see there's a whole bunch of other agenda items coming before you, including Springsburg Park on the 22nd. Um, I'll have additional information for you in anticipation of that meeting on some additional scenarios that Bill had asked me to take a look at and run. So we should have that finalized by then. Um, things are pretty busy in the office. Although not the Navy hangar, it is currently with the federal government shutdown. So we should have some sort of update on that when the government, if the government ever reopens. <laughs> um, a couple other items that were in your packet that I think are worth noting, uh, the Hartwell Avenue district rezoning with the town of Lexington. This sort of came out of nowhere. It was sent to the planning director. Right now there is a, um, I think there's one person left in the planning department in Lexington, so we don't think that anything is gonna happen between now and their annual town meeting. We think that we have some time, but Tony and I have been doing some outreach just to make sure that nothing is happening without us having a seat. Have we ever had a presentation on that? We, don't, we talked yeah. about it. We, we did when I was on the planning board. Yeah, but but that's like now. a long time it's ago. Different yes. now. Yeah. We almost have a joint planning meeting, but the planning director, the assistant planning director, and the I think the economic development director have all left. I, can I just, because you're on that topic, just yeah. mention that I was at a magic meeting where the MPO presented, and that project is on the uh, LRTP, yeah. the, so which is like the precursor to the TIP. Yeah. Um, so it is still percolating, and I did have a moment to speak to one of the Lexington Planning Board members, and there's no imminent action, but it is it is still. That's the with the with the roundabout. Yeah. Uh, not with the roundabout at the jug handle, but yes, around, no, some sort of signalized intersection at McGuire Road. Oh, so that's, I mean, that, that's an easy one. I'm more worried about what they're going to do with the jug handle and, and, and that. There, apparently there's some other idea about the round about the uh, jug handle. And that's separate from the zoning, actually. Uh, it is separate from the zoning, but the zoning is sort of inextricably, inextricably linked to the improvements because they're mm -hmm. going to try to set up some mitigation strategies for that. So, so right now there's nobody who could make a present. There's no staff. What was that woman's name? It was, it was an interesting name. Uh, the economic development person. Uh, so yeah. She, I guess she left. She may still be there, but there is a, a list of people that are no longer there, and so our contacts are no longer there, and their uh, head of community services, or the former head of community services, is also left. And they're getting some resistance from the neighborhood? That's my understanding. Mm. Yep. Um, I also included in your packet a copy of the commuting survey. I just think it's helpful to take a look at something that I think we're all sort of um, anecdotally aware of, but always good to see. And then lastly, I continue to chip away at the budget guideline. I am making no progress on getting the number down. Um, we are meeting with all the different department heads this week and next week to talk about contingency requests, uh, need, things that we're not thinking of. We have made a couple cuts trying to sort of look realistically at what's been spent historically and what's in play now, but between the 52.4 week energy mm -hmm. and trash, it is a one heck of a budget cycle. So I am saying this out loud just to remind everyone when I come at some point and say I can't meet guideline. We all remember this conversation, but um, it is a bit of a challenge this year. I have talked to finance committee. I did present and sort of say these are the challenges I have in front of me, the large majority of which I have very little control over. Um, so we're continuing to look at it, but it, it leaves very little room. Um, for alternative funding cycles. I am working with Lexington. Our agreement for our shared VSO is set to expire in June, and there are some sort of financial challenges associated with that. Lexington has five uh, Chapter 115 eligible benefits. Uh, people, uh, Bedford has 50. And right now the split is 90-10, 90, 90 to Lexington, 10% to Bedford. That sounds fair. Yeah, so <laughs> I have been working with Congressman Moulton's office to look at a federal earmark to cover the cost of a VSO because of the heavy presence of the VA. So I'm trying every possible avenue to find alternative funding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're gonna bring in more. I think I think it could be, It's the conversation so far with Congressman Moulton's office have been really successful. Um, I'm on the Bedford VA advisory board, and so we've been talking to Dr. Clifford about 
how do we make this work to sort of not have a budgetary impact on Bedford, provide better services to the That's board. great. That, that would be great if they could help us. With it. it would be excellent. So I'm banging away. I'm, I'm way over asking with the hope that they give me half and we all rejoice. Um, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, so I think. <laughs> you didn't say that. that loud. <laughs> no, they know what I've said to them. Please give me half. I'll ask for the full amount. Just give me half. Um, you know, we've been really transparent and sort of trying to especially look at all those different budget crunches that come from it. So that's one area where I'm taking a look at the budget now and saying, okay, can someone else pay for any of this? Um, we also had an a, a update for, about the dash today, and so I'll have more information to report back on that in a week or two. But I just want to let everyone sort of be in the loop on trying to work away at the guideline so far. That's it. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Edward, anything to report? Oh. Michael. I'm sad to announce for those who don't know, the passing of Doris Weber, Mickey Weber, um, in her 90s. Um, this happened uh, six days ago. Mickey Weber was the citizen of the year in 1995, uh, known to generations of, of people in the community. I uh, haven't, haven't heard anything about a memorial service yet. Um, I just wanted to mention that, that um, every month at the Hanscom Field Advisory Commission meeting, a big chunk of the agenda is for a monthly noise report. I've been asked by a resident to see about posting the noise report on, see if we can get that on the town website. Um, and uh, I want to explore how to do that in a meaningful way because the, the metric that they use to report the noise is not, it, it, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, you, a layperson w wouldn't understand it. It's not like 10 decibels, 9 decibels. It's, it's a metric called EXP, which is a complicated mathematical formula that has to do with cumulative noise exposure. And, but there are other data on the reports that people would be interested in, including year-to-year -year comparisons of operations in different categories of aircraft, night operations comparative year-to-year, -year, and also the number of complaints they get and where they come from. So. Um, I'll see if I can squeeze that down to a usable format and, and see if it would be possible to post it. Thank you. Thanks. I got I've got nothing. I don't either. Neither do I, so I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. I declare us adjourned because everybody I'm sure just said aye. 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 aye, aye, aye.